former President Donald Trump was indicted today for trying to overturn his loss to Joe Biden. We have to win in November, or we're not going to have Pennsylvania. They'll change the name. They're going to change the name of Pennsylvania. Pennsylvanians have a unique role with democracy and freedom. We have seen Pennsylvanians rise up at the ballot box. The work of making this world resemble one that you would prefer to live in is a lunch pail job. Republican lawmakers in Pennsylvania love to talk about being pro-life, except when it comes time to actually make laws. Hello and welcome to the Keystone Reckoning podcast for Monday, March 18th, 2024. I'm your host, Jesse White. The State House and Senate are back in session today, which I thought would be a good opportunity to focus in on some actual legislative issues. And one that caught my eye that I definitely wanted to bring up was a bill that was proposed by Representative Melissa Schusterman, 157th District, Democrat, out of Chester County. And it's a pretty straightforward bill. Uh, it's uh, it's just a co-sponsorship memorandum right now, uh, which for those who aren't familiar, uh, legislators submit memos or co-sponsorship memos to their colleagues to see who wants to sign on board a piece of legislation. And then after a period of time, it's actually introduced and given a bill number and goes through the, the process or not. So we don't have a bill number for this yet or legislative language. It's just an idea, uh, but it's a pretty interesting one and I think a pretty straightforward one. And the subject of the co-sponsorship memo is coverage for abortions through Pennsylvania's health ex- ex- health insurance exchange. Excuse me. So it says, under current PA law, health insurance plans purchased through the Pennsylvania Health Insurance Exchange Authority, otherwise known as Penny, are prohibited from providing coverage for the cost of an abortion, except in cases where the abortion is performed in order to prevent the death of the mother or if the pregnancy is a result of rape or incest. Abortion is health care, and therefore Pennsylvanians should not be prevented from receiving abortion services due to a lack of coverage in their health insurance plan. To address this situation, I plan to introduce legislation that would repeal provisions in PA law that would prevent coverage for abortions through health insurance plans purchased through Penny. The legislation would not require health insurance plans to include coverage for abortion services, but rather allow health insurance plans to provide our residents with additional health care options. Okay, so pretty straightforward, right? Current law doesn't allow these government uh, sponsored plans to include abortion coverage, except in cases of uh, life of the mother, uh, rape or incest. Pretty straightforward. This would lift those prohibitions. Again, I think it's a great bill. Uh, I I think it doesn't have a prayer of going anywhere because the makeup of the the chamber is obviously, uh, you know, even if you were to get it out of the one vote majority state house, There's no way it gets through the Republican state Senate. But that's really not the point. First of all, I've never used or judged a piece of legislation based on the likelihood of whether or not it will be passed. I mean, when I was a rep, I introduced bills all the time that never got passed or were co-opted by Republicans and passed by them. Uh, In some instances, I was actually all for it because, you know, pride of authorship doesn't need to be a thing. However. Because this has to deal with abortion, which is obviously a hot button topic heading into the election, uh, for all the reasons we already know, it made me think and wonder about abortion related legislation that has been introduced or is pending in the state house and Senate. Because, you know, there's this this common belief that, you know, abortion is a winning issue. uh, I'm sorry, abortion rights uh, are, are a winning issue for Democrats. Uh, in light of the Dobbs decision, and we've seen even more of that uh, with in Alabama with the issue with IVR, you know, the perception is Republicans really want to take away and continue to narrow a woman's right to choose in a variety of different circumstances when it comes to women's health, whereas Democrats are fighting for those rights and obviously fighting to empower women to be able to make their own health care decisions. Fairly straightforward. I don't think I'm overstating the positions there. But what I was curious was to see how the legislation stacks up with the politics. And by that, I mean, a lot of times members will introduce bills, not because they think they're ever going to become law, but because it's going to give them something to campaign on. It's going to give them a good press hit. It's going to allow them to do that circuit. Uh, 
might be able to – it's something that might be helpful with fundraising, even though they're not directly related, you know, nor could they be, you know, uh, on paper. But it's a way uh, – sponsoring a piece of legislation is a way to put your marker out there and let people know where you stand on an issue, if you're willing to stand up and fight on an issue, and see and allow someone to take leadership on an issue, right? So there are a lot of things you can do by introducing legislation that are adjacent to the actual idea of getting the bill passed. And I just assumed before I went and looked that a lot of Republicans would have been all over legislation that would restrict abortion rights or uh, codify certain policy decisions, whatever. It's something they could do to put their marker down as being, quote, pro-life. Which you know, we all know is a ridiculous term, but you know, anti-abortion. And it was fascinating what I found. So I did a search for all the co-sponsorship memos for this session, which goes all the way back to the beginning of last year. So we're going back to January 9th or whatever, 2023, all the way through today. And I ran it by a keyword of abortion. And there are 23 results that have shown up in this session, of which all but two, all but two, 21 out of 23 were legislative proposals intended to expand abortion rights, access to care, and only two of them were what we would consider to be pro-life. And to be quite honest, I don't even know if that's the case. So, for example, the one that was introduced early on by uh, Representative Stephanie Borowitz, who's just it, crazy, right? She's, you know, she's made all sorts of crazy statements. She's, uh, you know, she's, she's a fundamentalist right-wing Christian uh, and legislates that way. And it's obvious in the things she says and things she does. So if, if there's going to be some crazy coming out of that chamber, you could assume that Stephanie Borowitz is going to be involved somehow. So the bill that she sponsored, uh, which is House Bill 320, it is the fetal heartbeat bill. And it's it's common boilerplate language among Republicans and conservatives saying that a fetal heartbeat should be a metric that's used to determine whether or not abortion should be performed. It's pretty straightforward. The other one, was introduced by Representative Timothy Bonner from Mercer County, another Republican, Tallis Bill 753. And it's called, it's it's termed pain control for the unborn. And I was like, I, I'd never heard of this before. So I actually went and looked up the bill. And I was like, oh, okay, Republican, what are they going to try to limit? And it's fairly simple and straightforward. But it says that no abortion shall be performed. I was like, oh, okay, here we go. But then it says, without providing pain relief medication to the unborn child who is more than 15 weeks gestational age prior to the abortion process, unless the physician has prior knowledge of an adverse reaction to pain relief medication by the pregnant woman, or there is medical emergency where there is insufficient time to provide pain relief medication before the abortion is performed. Now, I'm sure, like I said, this is a, a and by the way, that bill has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 10 co-sponsors out of 203. Um, referred to the health committee, hasn't moved since. It's not going to move, uh, especially with Democrats in the majority. But the thing that was interesting to me was that if you're looking at that, if that is like the second m most, quote, pro-life bill in the uh, pending in the PA House or Senate right now, that's pretty telling. Because while I'm sure there's a lot more to that bill and that issue, and I don't want to speak about it because I'm I'm not haven't done my homework, but it's not an abortion ban. I mean, it's it's directing pain relief medication, which I'm sure there are issues with, but it's not a ban on abortion. It's not a uh, it's not an undue restriction on access to care, right? So what's interesting is, and if you look at the the other bills that are out there. And I'm not going to read them all, but it's, you know, Medicaid coverage for abortion, uh, Reproductive Freedom Act. Uh, uh, let's see. 
Oh, Stephanie Borowitz, uh, I, I take that back. She designated June 20 uh, of 2023 as life month. So I guess that was technically a pro-life piece of legislation, whatever. Um, funding for family pro- planning providers. Uh, permitting spousal, spousal notice and abortions. Uh, Patient Trust Act, ensuring reproductive rights. And there's a lot, I mean, it goes on and on and on. So the point being is that Democrats are out there proposing legislation on this issue. Republicans are dead silent. Dead silent. Even the craziest of the crazy are dead silent. And I have to wonder if there was anything inside the caucuses, especially in the House, because they're much more reactionary. If there was kind of an edict in the House or Senate Republican caucuses saying, ixnay on the abortion A legislation lay, because they know it's just bad politics and it could kill them, no pun intended, it could kill them going into this election cycle. Because everywhere abortion has been on the ballot, reproductive rights have been on the ballot, real or perceived, even in conservative areas. You look at like the ballot uh, initiatives in Kansas and uh, you know constitutional amendments in places like Kansas and in conservative areas. People don't put up with that crap, right? They will vote to protect a woman's right to choose in far greater numbers than anybody would have probably envisioned pre Dobbs. The numbers speak for themselves. So, and it only leads me to believe that there has to be some sort of, some grown up in the room on the Republican side, a political grown up at least, who said, wait a minute, guys, we got to back off of this because the more people we have thrown our names on this, the more we're associated with these issues, it's going to hurt us in a chamber where it is a razor thin, you know, one vote margin, you know. These these bills, someone signing on as a co-sponsor to some crazy anti-abortion bill, you know, a year ago could have major repercussions if it gets grabbed onto as an election issue and is used to defeat that member in 2024. Am I maybe giving them, the Republicans, a little too much credit for being so forward thinking politically? I don't know. But it seems odd to me that of the 23 pieces of legislation, the overwhelming majority of them are pro-abortion rights, pro-women's right to choose, pro-expanding access to care. And only three go in the other column, one of which was a non-controversial resolution, one of which was typical boilerplate heartbeat bill has been around forever, and the other one was pain control for the unborn, which... I don't think you could really even define as an anti-abortion bill. So, I don't know. It seems a little odd to me. And quite frankly, I was shocked. Because generally speaking, you know, Republicans do not hesitate to put crazy to paper uh, at, at the first opportunity they have. And we'll get into some of those as we continue on the podcast, some of the truly crazy ideas and legislation that gets floated. But I think that what we can do is come to the uh, one clear conclusion is that the legislative temperature in Pennsylvania clearly uh, shows a lukewarm response to anti-abortion legislation. And that shows me that the politics that we think are happening in other states and other parts of the country are very much alive and very much a play here in Pennsylvania. And I think that only bodes well for what we are going to see coming up in November, which will then allow us to take real legislative steps to address the underlying issue. So interesting to see. Congratulations to uh, Rep. Schusterman on her bill. Uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to see how that goes. Um, always want to applaud a good idea that, that you know, is can be controversial, but important. And I think we'll see more of those as well. So again, thank you very much for listening. This is Monday, March 18th. You are listening to the Keystone Reckoning Podcast. We will do it again tomorrow. Have a great day. Well, that's it then. And we've saved people the trouble of voting. What's next? 
Our, our point is that it's... I understood the point. We're going to South Carolina to set up Illinois. When I ask what's next, it means I'm ready to move on to other things. So, what's next? We're done. Fantastic. 